So hello, uh, my, na my name is uh, Dr. Ben Liu. I'm uh, mostly an inpatient psychiatrist here in Portland, Oregon, uh, where I did my CL fellowship. And um, I am part of the Climate Psychiatry Alliance and I've, I've been a part of it since I, I was a PGY3. Um, and so I'm joined here by three uh, very esteemed uh, colleagues here. So I will let everyone introduce themselves as we get ready to talk about uh, eco distress and, and more broadly climate change, the climate crisis and, and mental health. Uh, so maybe Manal, do you wanna sure, kick it off? You. Uh, my name is Manal. I just recently completed medical school from St. George's University. Uh, I'm super excited to be sharing a little bit about eco distress with you all today. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Mario Nahera. I've also recently finished med school here in Guatemala. I'm currently at Guatemala at Universidad Francisco Marroquin. And yeah, I'm so excited to be here. Hi everyone, my name is Priscilla. I'm a third year medical student at Western University of Health Sciences in Oregon and one of the Psych Sign National Chairs. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Okay, so um, many, many learning objectives packed in here for what we hope is a 30 to 35 minutes of, of the actual lecture slides and then, and then we can go into this, some discussion. But very broadly speaking, we're talking about climate crisis and mental health. Um, and th that's what we here do here at Climate Psychiatry Alliance, um, which you are all very welcome to join. Like uh, we would love to get junior, uh, junior colleagues here, med students, residents. Um, and uh, some of the topics that we're gonna talk about here, Mario's got point two here, um, understanding that we do need to feel some of these charged feelings related to the climate crisis. Uh, there are many benefits of this. Uh, well. There's a need for it. And then Manal is going to take point three here about resilience and, and uh, how do we ultimately have um, both the uh, both the grounding um, versus the presencing and purposing actions. Um, and so uh, then, then Priscilla is going to help us get to the end with, uh, well, hope versus hopelessness and then action, uh, as well as... Uh, all throughout, we're talking about um, uh, insights on communication. I don't think we actually have slides that are, uh, we, we do have them, but not included in the slide set about communication directly, but but that's uh, communicating about climate change and, and climate related emotions. Um, that seems kind of very tied into what we do as uh, like therapists um, in, in, well, what we do as healthcare providers too. So what we really have an opportunity to do. So um, here's an example of a survey of uh, young people, very recent, uh, it took over, it took place in 10 countries uh, and altogether 10,000 youth. And you look at these uh, proportions of how much people are worried um, or scared, um, you see like 70 to 80% for most of these categories, but even that lowest category of the 45%, uh, that's a staggering number uh, when, I'm when I'm looking at like negatively affected functioning. Um, cause, uh, that's, that's, that's almost a half and, um, that's kind of shocking. Um, the youth are growing up in a very different environment than even my generation, millennials, I'm mid thirties. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, it's, uh, this is a very, uh, big, uh, area of, of interest. Um, not just for therapists, not just for the American Psychiatric Association, um, it's, it's clearly, I mean, just looking at the numbers uh, of what people, what, what the youth are struggling with, this is a huge crisis. So beyond, beyond talking about, so, so just a little bit of like a, about climate change when we're talking about like what, I mean, how does that interface with mental health? I mean, we, we can think about it on like three or four different levels. One level would be acute disasters. So that's fires and floods. Um, being some of the most common ones. And of course, there's going to be direct uh, mental health sequelae of, uh, of Hurricane Katrina or campfire in California uh, when people are getting displaced and, and, uh, and uh, otherwise just very fearful for their basic safety and their basic attachments to their home. Even if you do return home, it might not feel the same as it used to. Um, so acute disasters, slow moving disasters, on the other hand, that, that could be drought is like, a prime example um, that has huge effects on 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 um, 
on uh, cities and communities and um, sea level rise, air pollution. These would be other um, very climate crisis related uh, features, uh, types of disasters. Uh, a third category would be heat waves. Um, and these are actually like the real big silent killers, um, not quite named the way that like a hurricane might be, might be given a name like Hurricane Maria. Um, but, uh, but yet these actually have tremendous amounts of morbidity, mortality, increased rates of suicidal, suicidality, um, as seen in, in well done studies comparing folks in Mexico versus the US with a slightly bigger effect on the suicide ratio in in Mexico, where perhaps there's more people living closer to the land, um, or maybe just different temperature uh, variations affect communities differently. Um, so a fourth level would be outside of acute disasters, slow moving disasters and heat waves. The fourth level is where we're getting that in this slide is um, the eco distress. And so that could be many different feelings as you see on this climate emotions wheel, um, from made by our friends in the Climate Mental Health Network. Um, and so there are a lot of new terms that, that Mario will introduce, um, so nostalgia, um, and then eco distress is kind of a broader idea. Um, and then there's, there's, there's a lot of different new ideas that we wanna even consider getting into the DSM, um, considering how much distress the youth are in now. Uh, so let me pass it off, Mario. Hi, so let's now discuss some of the new terminology being developed to address and describe the emotion humans are experiencing due to climate change. Um, we, as Ben told, uh, said, we will be covering two, two of the most common themes, so nostalgia and eco-anxiety. Next slide, please. Okay, so nostalgia. I found this word honestly amazing as it describes the impact of climate change on our perception. It's a sense of loss related to a place important that, to that person uh, that has been destroyed secondary to climate change. Um, the loss of a place can be a really challenging experience. It can be destroyed by wildfires, coastal erosions, rising sea level. Many people tend to form really strong attachment to the place they live, and they find a sense of stability, security, and personal identity in these places. Um, this local community, um, when, when some people are asked, they report greater happiness, life satisfaction, satisfaction, and optimism. So you can imagine how they feel when these places are taken away from them, they are destroyed. Maybe you live near a forest. So now imagine how would you feel if it's destroyed by a wildfire? Next slide, please. Now, eco-anxiety. It is described as a chronic fear of environmental doom. Uh, the term describes the emotional and mental states associated with awareness of threats of climate change and concurrent distress in the face of it's threatening implication for the future. Maybe they worry about oneself, our children, later generations, and watching all it go down can cause all of these emotions. It can be described as fear, anger, guilt, feeling of powerlessness, exhaustion. Next slide, please. So eco-anxiety is often used as an umbrella term that encompasses all of these several different emotions. So I already, already mentioned anger, helplessness, despair, phobia, fear, powerlessness, exhaustion. I just wanted to use this slide to represent visually how it must feel. Now, uh, so we can see how the climate crisis creates a realm of uncertainty. There is a complicated taxonomy of emotions. This diagram can be intimidating as it has a lot of things going on, a lot of emotions, but it is used just to show the complicated roadmap of the impact of climate change. Many of these responses should not really be considered pathological as it, they are within the normal emotional response to a realistic problem. Next slide, please. So 
we talked a lot about emotions. <laughs> so now let's talk about how to navigate through them. Next slide, please. Let's imagine our emotions as an iceberg. We are largely unconscious as humans. So if we want to know how we truly feel, we need to search under the barrier of our conscious mind. When we do this search, the feelings start to come to the surface and they scare us, they produce anxiety and other nasty feelings. So maybe we tend to disavow. Next slide, please. So Carly Hickman, a psychologist and climate psychotherapist, tends to tell this quote to their patients. I find it honestly just a brutal quote. I love it. Let me help you feel your depression and your rage because paradoxically, by connecting with those feelings, you will start to function again. The anxiety we feel is a rational response. The problem is getting stuck and allowing it to take over our life. Next slide. So let maybe get out of the way of the both extremes that are shown in this slide. In one hand, we have the do mentality. The problem with the do mentality, mentality really is that we tend to feel helplessness and collapse and we do not do the work. We are so caught up in our emotions that we feel powerless, we just freeze. The, in the other hand, we have the heroic view. The problem with this is that we tend to let go of our anxiety and our feelings. We tend to think that someone will save us. Economists, uh, scientists, the government, someone will save us. So the hero will appear and we will be saved. So we let go. That's also a problem. So reality lies somewhere. Sorry, Ben, can you go? Back? So reality lies somewhere in the middle where you realize that you are a part of the problem. And now, now can we change like that? <laughs> That's it's it's a mature, it's a mature thing to realize that you are part of the problem. And as Caroline Hickman said, acknowledging our despair and our anxiety is the first step toward transforming them into action. So now let's take action and let's talk about some interventions. Um, interventions for eco-anxiety can embrace the holistic model that relies in two main themes. Firstly, we have to foster clients' inner resilience approach. Uh, inner resilience, this is an approach where we help changing the suffering and making it a more meaningful emotion out of the distress that they feel. The second thing is to focus on helping the client make connections. As Carolyn Hickman also said, uh, we can shift the focus from eco-anxiety to eco-empathy. After all, we all feel this anxiety. These are feelings that can link us, that can make connections. We can work together to achieve a goal. So let's support our emotions and let's process our individual suffering, maybe together. Next slide. So to recap, let's do inner work like education and self-awareness of our feelings. Let's build resilience through our self-perception and through individual beliefs and emotions. And let's encourage clients to take action in environmental engagement. They will feel, they will feel so much better when they start to do something about it. Let's create safe social support and Last, let's engage with nature. Let's use nature as a way of healing. So that's it. So uh, I know Manal is next up going to be talking about uh, uh, one, one framework. Uh, well, actually more than just that. Uh, the transformational resilience is one framework on how to uh, how to enhance meaning focused coping. Um, what this meaning focused coping um, speaks to right here on this slide, um, and I'll we'll describe in a second. Um, but this is another example of how we can um, be in touch with uh, what is going on in the world with society with the climate crisis, um, whilst also um, maybe to a lesser extent, uh, it's not purely about like feeling the feelings, but uh, but I think that is a part of this because um, because like Mario was saying, 
um, when you are just doing heroic, when you're on one end of that, uh, of that spectrum that, that went from, uh, the, uh, the apathy and the, what's the point that end, uh, remember there was the other end the heroic, let's save everyone and let's just work nonstop and problem focused, uh, coping, which Manal is going to speak about. So, so being right in the middle is, that means feelings and feelings. Um, and then uh, finding a way to, like on the last slide here that Mario shared, uh, last second to last slide is that step one, feel the feelings. Step two, uh, create, so um, encourage people to find connections. Um, so that could be with groups and with nature. Um, and ultimately you'll probably find your way to um, doing some sort of action that is that is uh, pro-environmental, if, if not at least pro-health, because there is a lot of overlap between those two. The co-benefits of doing healthy things for yourself actually have healthy things for our environment as well. Plant-based diets and, and active, uh, active transportation. Um, so bicycling and then less driving and less, less uh, uh, things that are bad for your health. So, um, so yeah, let me pass that off to you, Manal. Thank you. So as Ben mentioned, um, one ideal way to cope with a stress such as climate change um, is something that we refer to as meaning-centered coping. Um, now you might be wondering, what exactly is it? Um, I like to think of it as a way of coping using optimism. Um, Meaning-focused coping draws on values to evoke positive feelings. Um, that allows one to bear the worries without having to minimize or deny any painful reality. You acknowledge the stressor, but you're working actively to change your perspective about it. This is especially relevant when a problem can't be removed or resolved immediately, something like climate change, and it demands active involvement over a longer term. With repeated validation of the legitimacy of painful, eco-anxious feelings, you learn to channel them rather than banish them. So obviously this would require some type of cognitive restructuring and how, how might we steer people to do so? Well, any tragedy or trauma can be seen as an opportunity to grow and to reframe it as an experience of empathy. In terms of climate change, we recognize that there is now greater societal awareness of the problem um, than there was in the past. And this allows us to put more trust into the various societal actors out there like scientists and environmental organizations that are working for climate solutions. If we go on to the next slide. Um, over here, we expand a little bit more on meaning focused coping um, and also contrast that with two other types of coping. Uh, so meaning focused coping is shown to have positive effects. It allows for a greater engagement with the environment, um, a higher life satisfaction and a greater well-being, regardless of how serious the concerns someone may have about climate change. Um, however, Ohala, the author of the paper where we learn more about these methods of coping. Um, she also mentions two other types of coping strategies in her questionnaire study um, in a demographic of 12 year old Swedish adolescents. Um, these include problem based focus, uh, problem focused coping and emotion related coping. Now, problem focused uh, coping is where you're gathering more information about the problem and are actively working on finding um, a solution and taking more steps to resolution. And while this is positively associated with increased environmental engagement, it also leads to higher levels of general negative effect, including anxious um, and depressive feelings. On the other hand, emotion-related coping is more so de-emphasizing the problem. This involves removing the negative feelings associated with a stressor by using strategies like avoidance, distancing, and denial. The outcomes show decreased environmental efficacy and a less negative effect than problem-based coping. If you want, next slide. Thank you. Um, so the International Transformation, Transformational Resilience Coalition has a resilient growth model, which is a well-suited framework to enhance meaning-focused coping, helping individuals build capacity for transformational resilience, um, includes trauma-informed knowledge of the neurobiology behind trauma and stress and how it may affect the mind, body, and behavior. These include presencing and purposing skills um, that help with this. And we have a very neat acronym um, by uh, called GROWTH um, that, uh, that is broken down into both these skills. 
Um, so this includes, uh, so presencing skills um, allow us to help calm the body and mind in the time of adversity. This includes remaining grounded, remembering your personal skills, resources, and the social support network that's around you, and observing your reactions and thoughts to the situation with self-compassion and free of judgment. In contrast, purposing skills are used to find meaning, direction, and hope in adversity. This may involve watching for insight in meaning and climate-related hardship, tapping into the values you want to live by during adversity, and harvesting hope for new possibilities by making choices that increase personal, social, and environmental well-being. Um, if we go on to the next slide, we have an example of a presencing, a presencing skill or at the top. We can see that um, it's indicated by the O, which is observe in the growth acronym. Um, and that's simply to observe your reaction to a situation. The ITRC lays it out with the ABC thought and emotion record, um, which, you know, fun fact is actually an example of CBT. Uh, you start by thinking about an event um, and what your belief is. For example, um, let's start with if I don't do it, climate change will grow worse. Um, then you ask yourself, is this really true? Uh, the answer in this case would be no. And you assess that you're overgeneralizing that thought. Um, and, and instead you write an alternative belief. Uh, this may be thinking that, you know, um, I alone can't prevent climate change and it'll, I'll be more effective if I care for myself and my family. As a result of this alternative belief, you become more at ease. Um, and that is a useful tool to reframe and restructure thoughts that may lead to increased anxiety. Uh, so this is a very neat tool. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Manal. So uh, this is a whole separate paper. So if that last slide was the O in the growth mnemonic for transformation resilience, uh, well, this is, um, well, I guess dialectics. Um, Really, I think of this. This is this was a paper that our um, some of our steering committee in um, some of our steering committee leads in in CPA, Dr. Lewis, Dr. Uh, Haas, um, they uh, they published on this in a psychodynamic psychotherapy journal. So so yeah, as you are all going into residencies, um, those are two of the core competencies of uh, of of psychiatric therapy training. So uh, CBT versus psychodynamic therapy. Um, I think I'll save the slide for a different day, maybe for a climate 102. But uh, the um, I guess a common theme from prior uh, prior slides is just that uh, before you even think about how to get people to think through and be more nimble, more flexible uh, in moving between these pairs of extremes, these five common themes in the climate crisis: hope versus hopelessness, nature as comfort, nature as threat, as examples. Um, even before you think about how to navigate those, usually there is probably an opportunity for therapists to uh, provide containment in the face of this hyper object of climate change, something that is so vast in time and space that um, it can be overwhelming. It can be hard to wrap your head around it. And so like cl clearly not one person, not what agent, not one agency, not one country uh, has like all the answers, right? We're all kind of interdependent on this and we need a new way. I mean, it would seem that uh, there needs to be a new way of uh, relating to our environment uh, for us to make different changes. I mean, economics withstanding, of course, like people can make the easy choice when it's not twice the price. Um, but uh, but yeah, notwithstanding that, um, this is just a, a, good, a good slide to remind that we'd also need climate, uh, that we need containment as a first step. So feeling the feelings. And so, uh, so another good summary slide actually is this one from Dr. Lewis as well, Janet Lewis. Um, and so what is, um, what do we, what is adaptation, psychological adaptation to uh, climate change? And so think of it as a few steps like this. So turning towards it, um, turning towards the, uh, what is going on in society and, and then, and then turning towards the emotions, um, in a way that's ultimately going to be engaged and not just apathy and panic. And then, um, all the while, um, there are ways that we can have better positive affect. Um, part of that usually lies in um, step one, feeling the feeling. Step two, uh, finding community, joining places that that can at least not invalidate your um, concerns uh, for the societal ills, uh, whatever's going on out there that's kind of scary. Um, and so ultimately, uh, this can hopefully create the mental space to think clearly about what to do, 
to assess and reassess goals and pathways to those goals. So that's a good transition to Priscilla. Uh, you're going to help close up our slide part. Yeah. So um, during this talk, some of you that are here just talking about climate change and those emotions might be difficult. So considering that, we've got to address these feelings before you know we can really think about it. We've, we've got to just address that they are actually there and not suppress them. Some of the most common feelings that people can feel when they're thinking about climate change are hope and hopelessness. Next slide, please. So concerning climate change and climate change emotions, we know that youth are disproportionately affected. These extreme emotions can include sadness, worry, fear, anxiety, hopelessness, like we've already mentioned. There was one study done in 2021 that sampled 10,000 16 to 25 year olds. And 56% of those surveyed said that they felt that the planet was doomed. And the word doomed is pretty significant. It's not just like, oh, okay, you know, I'm a little bit worried. Doom is a very strong thing to feel. And that's over half of young people are feeling that way. So this is a, a pretty significant thing that a lot of young people are dealing with related to climate change. Next slide, please. Considering that, what are we gonna do to actually address that hopelessness? One answer is radical hope. So radical hope is not this you know, doom idea of, you know, there's nothing that is going to work, there's, there's nothing that we can do, or this idealistic hope, like things are just going to work out. It's kind of like a middle of the path hope, kind of almost like what Mario was talking about earlier, where we think about, okay, if we work individually and collectively for realistic goals, we actually have a really good chance of making some differences in climate change. Next slide, please. Suzanne Moser is a leading climate change researcher who came up with what she calls the seven ingredients of authentic, grounded hope. So to understand these ingredients, she asks us to posit some of the following questions. Where are we at with climate change? How does that make me feel? What is achievable? How can we get from here to there? What can I do? What am I going to do when the going gets tough and things don't seem to be working out? What do I want to do and what will help sustain me? What are others going to do and what will my community do? Next slide, please. Sources of hope. Where can we find them? They can be local, they can be state, federal, international action on climate change and mental health. It could come from you volunteering. It could come from collective advocacy, ad, activism. There's also been a huge increase in advocacy in healthcare. Next slide, please. So what brings, oh, you can go back to the pre previous slide, sorry. What brings you hope is individual and it could be different or the same as someone else. And I really wanna emphasize that point that it's completely individualistic because emotions can be shared or they can be personal. Next slide. So I think a lot of you know what a mood board is. And when I was thinking about climate change and hope and all the emotions I'm feeling, I kind of just started piecing these different things together in my life that gave me hope. Portland, Oregon is where I currently live. And recently they approved a $750 million climate action plan. Now, this kind of investment into the environment and climate change action is not limited to Oregon. There are cities all over the world that are investing in clean energy, public transportation, decarbonization. The Kindness Farm, that is a local community garden where I spend a lot of my free time to help get away from the city, de-stress after rotations, which is, I know, something all of us are feeling. And uh, the picture on the right is 
a image of some pre-K students at Jones Valley Teaching Farm in the area where I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. There's been a huge push to teach young students, young kids about where their food comes from, eating more fruits, vegetables, a plant-based diet. And those are all things that are gonna address climate change and actually make our population a lot healthier too. Next slide. Climate change hope move board continued. There's been a huge increase in uh, local farmers markets. You may even go to one on a weekly or monthly basis. This is my local, martlet, local market in uh, Portland, Oregon, the Lentz International Farmers Market. And farmers markets are a gr great way to support your local farmers and uh, local workers and also eating more sustainably rather than having your food shipped from halfway across the world. There's also been a huge, previous slide, <laughs> there's also been a huge increase in healthcare advocacy. And a lot of that push is actually coming from medical students. The Planetary Health Report Card is one organization run by medical students that partners with health profession schools to address where, to give them some options of how they could improve their impact on climate change, uh, such as looking at um, where they could change their energy source, recycling, et cetera. And the Medical Students for a Sustainable Future is another organization run by medical students that's focused on curriculum, advocacy, and really doing incredible work addressing climate change. And those are both organizations that you can be involved in as medical students. Next slide. Thinking about hope, we have to also think about how are we gonna get there? And for a lot of people, hope comes from engagement and action. So we have this mnemonic, which I know med students love mnemonics. It helps us remember things. Uh, and we have care too. So clinical, a lot of us have experienced extreme weather events and our patients are subject to that too. So knowing when there's gonna be a heat wave, know about it and then help your patients prepare. Know where local cooling centers are, know where they can get uh, free bottles of water or even offer that to them. Administrative, work with your medical school, clinic, hospital, et cetera, about developing clean energy, compost, et cetera. Advocacy, talk to your state legislators, your local legislators about action they're taking to help address climate change. Research, there's still a lot we don't know about climate change and particularly how climate change is impacting mental health. And education. Today is a wonderful first step, or maybe one step out of the many you've already taken, to educate yourself about climate change and also how it's impacting mental health. And once you have a solid understanding of the situation, then you can share that knowledge with your friends, your family, and your patients. Okay, so now we have some discussion questions. We do have a small group, but that can be fun because we can get to know each other a little bit better. So I want to pose the question, what brings you hope for the climate? And you can unmute or put it in the chat, or if you're really nervous, you can DM me or somebody else and I'll read it for you. And speakers, we can also uh, try to tee it up in the chat box as well. I feel like this is something that changes day by day. Yeah, I think I agree. It changes day by day. I think it's also something that brings hope. Um, can just be having discussions like this, Come, people coming together, talking about it. Yeah, I like that one. I, I feel like, uh, you know, meeting different activists, different like presidents of their local 350. I feel like a lot of people have said the theme of just, you know, I just talk about it like more than your average person. Um, like if I'm at the grocery store and, and granted, I realize that sometimes coming off as a zealot, sometimes people get a little bit, uh, uh, they might raise their eyebrows or it, it might come off a certain way, but but there's subtle ways you can do it. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, just having the space, uh, 
means that we're not like turning away from like a lot of like like unfortunate things that are happening. Yeah, thanks, Hope. I guess it also brings me hope, like the COP twenty three that we are having right now, like all of those uh, people just connected and trying to figure out a solution to this. It's a big scale solution, I hope. I uh, recently learned uh, from my fiance, who's at the third year applying anesthesia. He was telling me that the field of anesthesia is very aware, aware of their environmental impact and they are actively trying to address it and trying to research new drugs that are not as negatively impact, impacting the environment, but still are effective for patients. So I think it's really cool that there are other specialties, not just psychiatry, that are also invested in, in climate change action. Uh, I had no idea. I also know nothing about anesthesia. So <laughs> um, I had no idea that, or wouldn't even think that there you know, are specific specialties that are maybe contributing more than others negatively, but that also gives them room to have positive impacts. So that was kind of cool to hear. Can I um, uh, hope you reminded, uh, not hope, but Priscilla, you reminded me of your, uh, well, of kind of my thing uh mm -hmm. about about multiple specialties getting in on this mm -hmm. but as a as an aside can i can i like give examples of anesthesia as a specialty um so uh anesthesia so these volatile anesthetics the isoflurane yeah. sevoflurane um some of those are extremely carbon intensive and yeah. there's alternatives to them um and nitrous um they a lot of hospitals have it running through pipes in the wall and mm -hmm. yet like 98 percent or some like staggering number in the 90 percent just basically leaks away um so it's actually better to just it's it's actually you save a little bit of money the hospital can save like ten thousand dollars fifteen thousand dollars if you just have it in like single canisters that are just kept mm -hmm. and don't leak so um providence locally in portland actually they had an anesthesia i think his name was brian can't remember his last name but they refitted uh well they they, they transformed they basically changed it to the canister from the wow. pipes and uh you get hospital savings when you can make like a money case then definitely your cfo <laughs> at your hospital can do it or, or even if it's like cost neutral like there are ways that we can avoid some one-time disposables in the or for like yeah. blue towels and other things like um and then and then it's like cost is equal um mm -hmm. but uh yeah reusable gowns you could wash them a hundred times and it's a little more water but a whole lot less transport and other things um if you're a pcp i'm not going to just go on a laundry list of sustainability <laughs> things but like so many things we can do um for pcps an obvious thing is that uh instead of using uh powdered uh inhalers powdered albuterol you can use uh I think it's called metered dose inhaler. So like, it's a different thing. So these are different examples. Yeah. Um, oh, and that leads me to my thing for hope. Uh, what came to mind is that just every specialty is getting in on it. Different healthcare systems are getting in on it. Kaiser, um, they have like, I think six out of seven days are meatless and maybe they have like a meatloaf one day of the week in their cafeterias. But but each health system is doing their own thing. Um, you know, everyone's gonna have their own strengths because there's so many at every level, energy for the buildings, energy for the supply chains. Um, what we put in the cafeterias and on the patient trays and in the vending machines. Um, each specialty is doing its own thing. And there's just so many examples of people taking action and academic journals. Nature has a nature climate change journal. Um, so there is action being done like within healthcare. And that's kind of exciting, even within healthcare. Any other? Uh, maybe we, I, I know we have more discussion questions and I just kind of talked a lot on that one. But uh, I will put the next question on the board. Okay, so addressing feelings of hopelessness. We talked about what things can actually bring us hope, but what challenges do you see for yourself in actually maintaining this? People are thinking I can just talk, uh, maintaining hope. Um in self and others, uh, well, maintaining hope versus the hopelessness. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, I guess hope, I mean, there's always hope that, you know, it, 
it's not like an all or nothing kind of outcome, right? It's like, there's always the hope of that, like, you know, if we all collectively do a whole lot more then uh, you know, so many people are going from zero and if we just activate them in one way and empower people to feel like they can feel one thing that they can do. If you're a six year old and all you could do is like reuse your plastic bag, at least there's something you can do. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's challenging sometimes when, when some things are, uh, you know, challenging like a COVID shot, right? Like it was hard to convince half of our country to get a COVID shot. But, um, but uh, I, think, I think there's always hope that, uh, you know, like if we can decrease the, the temperature increases by 0.3 degrees Celsius compared to point, uh, as opposed to 0.5 degrees Celsius in the next 20 years, I mean, that's going to change a lot for so many people um, and, and for ourselves. I think we will all be affected. And so there's, there's a lot at stake and uh, we can all do something. Um, but, but yeah, it can often feel like, wow, what I'm doing, am I just spinning my wheels? Um, so, so I think that part about being in a community is valuable because uh, we all have to learn and uh, our own climate journeys. And uh, for me, my climate journey is very tied into my healthcare journey. So I'm trying to find a way to always um, keep the two kind of tied to each other, or like connected to each other. And then there's so there are so many ways you can do this, like in the Charis mnemonic that we saw. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna zip it um, for myself, <laughs> so somebody else can answer. I, I, mean, I think, oh no, go ahead, go ahead, Hope. Are you sure? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess all I was really gonna say was that sometimes kind of similarly, like seeing people together like this is very helpful in maintaining hope. But then on the other side, you see a lot of things out, you know, in the world that, that kind of, makes it hard to maintain hope sometimes like um yeah I guess just kind of things like seeing you know not, things not really improving despite maybe actions to try to improve them um just because of like the nature of like I'm in like I'm in, a, in New York City right now you know so seeing like garbage everywhere <laughs> even though they placed more garbage cans, you know, like that it doesn't really because of like the attitude of the the area. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, yeah, I think that's why it's sometimes hard to maintain hope is just because of things that we see versus, you know, it's like kind of a back and forth. You hear great things and then difficult things and it's hard to balance sometimes and keep the hope that way. But um, it's kind of like you said, like we, there's always hope. It's just kind of like how hopeful you're feeling in the moment, I think. Yeah, I, I think what you were saying about New York and, and the trash just kind of like being everywhere, it was kind of making me thinking about visibility and, you know, just like what we see on a day to day basis versus the work that we don't actually see people doing and some of the positive things that are happening. You know, there's like the whole term of doom scrolling. And a lot of times it's frustrating because, you know, media, social media and news broadcasters or whatever, they want things that are going to be sensationalized. So it's there's going to be more clicks if there's a bad headline. But there's actually a lot of really good work being done in lots of different communities that we just don't know about because that's not what's being headlined. So, I mean, that part of it can be frustrating because in a lot of ways that isolates us, but then it's nice when we discover things like the Climate Psychiatry Alliance, or we discover a new community garden or something like that. It's, it's nice to say, oh, this has been here. This has maybe been here for a really long time. I just didn't know about it. So that that's, both a positive and a negative, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I'm always surprised at just what I am finding. Like, uh, 
uh, one of our CPA residents, she's a resident now, um, she shared uh, a link to this, like, it's on my phone that bookmarked, but there's like, it's a website on curricula for health and environment. Uh, I can give you the specific name. Medicine for a Changing Planet. There's just so much stuff going on. I just, I can't believe it. I mean, there's some of, uh, in these early stages, reinventing the wheel. But, uh, but uh, yeah, it's just so exciting to just see, like, how much energy there is, like, at grassroots levels. And then, and then people even, like, teaming up to build some websites and, and come up with some nice graphics. And uh, I wish I could show on my phone. But, uh, yeah, Medicine for a Changing Planet. Um, yeah, educational resources, advocacy resources. You look at certain states, New Hampshire, Healthcare Workers for Climate Action, they like, they do work for a tiny state versus California, like uh, Climate Health Now, they also do work and focusing on local, like uh, they really helped uh, advocate for, um, I think, keeping air pollution limits in, in red line neighborhoods. Um, I think that was what, it, something about environmental justice, it's totally slipped in my head, but this is like in the Bay Area. So focusing at the level of like, county and city governments you can actually do a lot of work um yeah but uh but yeah to, to, yeah no, go, go ahead. ahead i just i think there's one more question maybe if we want to okay so final question how can you stay engaged in climate activism and um, mental health or that the advocacy or just supporting your own mental health Well, <clears throat> sorry, well, I guess that an easy answer for this is for my own mental health, I try to pollute the less I can. I, I've i also tried to uh, do a diet that consists only in 10-20% of meat. I know that's not a big thing, but it gives me peace. But at the same time, I cannot completely quit meat because <laughs> I do enjoy it. So it gives me peace and mental health to do these little things that I hope add up. I think you also kind of mentioned a lot of it. Um, a lot of it is just kind of acknowledging, you know, to stay engaged with your own mental health, kind of just acknowledging first, like what you're actually feeling. Kind of like any way that I think that we work on our mental health, you know, is and through things like CBT and stuff like that, just kind of first acknowledging it and then finding ways to cope with that, um, which sometimes might be changing our actions like eating less meat and stuff like that. So... Yeah, that's kind of how I think about it. Yeah, that's that's interesting. It's uh these sustained activities rather than the that, rather than the one off things and you just forget about it. Um, I almost want reminders, you know, build it in so that I I, I even when I veer towards one of the poles of of uh oh, it's too much, the overwhelming or or I'm getting into the kind of uh heroic uh let's just action, 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 um, like uh, it just helps to have reminders, whether that's in your own daily life uh, schedule, um, like just in your own personal health behaviors or um, living behaviors or uh, or like being engaged in some sort of activity that, that reminds you like, oh yeah, this is what we're dealing with here. And there's others around me that are also worried about this. Um, yeah, that's staying engaged. I think one thing that is uh, at times been a struggle for me is that some of the, the changes I try and make, like um, I have been, you probably know this, that Portland has a huge food scene and we have lots of food trucks and things like that. And, you know, my friends and I, we like to go and try those things out, but then there's a lot of food waste with that. And so yeah. I like to bring my... Um, I have like a container that has reusable utensils in it. 
and so I'm always trying to, to bring it. And then when I don't, or I, you know, all of this, not all of a sudden, but kind of on a whim, my friend's like, hey, let's go do this. I, I don't necessarily get mad at myself, but I'm like, oh my gosh, like I, I really wish I had remembered. And then, <laughs> and so I think that can be a challenge for me too, is, is being hard on myself when I don't, when I'm not perfect about it, or it's like, I try, I'm trying to make changes, but I'm not a hundred percent on it, even if I'm drinking. So that's something that I'm always working on is, you know, kindness, self-kindness and appreciating the effort I am trying to make. Yeah. It's so easy. I think for us who are, um, I'd say to some extent, we're all a little type A in this <laughs> pre-med thing and this medical thing. Um, it's easy to kind of like get off that point where it's like, oh, the, 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 well, it turns into OCD to the point that you're like, I don't even want to turn on the heater because, you know, this is 2,000 square feet and I'm just here. I'll just throw on a jacket. So mm -hmm. you're like freezing and, and doing the things, uh, like you said, kindness to yourself. Um, yeah, it's it's a marathon, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not like uh, you don't want to put yourself through like huge, uh, like health risks. <laughs> um, and uh, just you don't want to stress and yeah, you don't need to feel guilt over every little thing you do. Um, and so sometimes there are certain act positive actions you can take and, and hopefully you'll be able to find that comfort where it's like, hey, my participation in this activity twice a month um, gives me a little bit of a leash so that I can, you know, forget my fork. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hopefully your math can be generous because <laughs> this is a marathon. <laughs> More generous than that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this was a good discussion. Thank you, Hope. And uh, and thank you also, uh, Carolina, as well. I know I know this is becoming like a group discussion here with our with our mighty but tiny tiny but mighty group and uh, moving this forward. So uh, I think that is like the last slide. But uh, any final words of wisdom, people? Yep, not that slide, but I'll go back to the questions. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to you guys. Um, it was great. And, uh, you know, I, th I think it's great that you wanted to put this out there and try to do some education and, um, yeah, kind of get some talking about it. I couldn't think of a better word for it, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think thank you for showing up. Uh, and yeah, I very much agree. Like this is uh we haven't actually had this format. It's it was a it was a PowerPoint slide set, but really, yeah, I'm, I'm so happy with the discussion. <clears throat> yeah, and honestly, it's it's kind of healing just to, I mean, just like it is, <laughs> uh, recognize the severity of the situation, and then and then kind of feel things, and and better yet, find some community. So, so. Uh, yeah, thank you all. Um, Priscilla, any any closing words or Mario, Manal, I know. You um, guys put sorry. in a lot of effort. Yeah. I just oh, wanted Carolina. to say, yeah. yes, that the presentation was really good. I really learned so much with the new terms and like all the things that they're implementing to, to give a name for this that I think that eco-anxiety it's actually something that everyone suffers for just we don't know how to put like a name to it and it was really helpful to hear all your parts and explaining all of this to us so thank you very much really appreciate the comment carolina um i'm gonna put in the chat um like just how to sign up for climate psychiatry alliance oh, i'll put my email in there as well because i help like uh give people an intro too that's my email um but also like all sorts of resources i'll put in the chat so thank you for thank you for speaking up at the end um uh websites uh well climatepsychiatry.org is 